that there is no one else for us and Lord if you are for us who can be against us Amen. Father we thank you Lord that we have your strength to draw upon we thank you Lord that you give us life you give us hope you give us a promise Lord and your promises are as good as gold and so Father we love you praise you and honor you and all God's <laughs> children said Amen. Amen. Amen awesome you may be seated all right Open your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 30. And we will be looking at victory in repentance. And this will most likely be a two-part study. I doubt that I'm going to be able to get through all this uh, tonight. So uh, when we come back next week, it'll, we'll probably can pick up where we left off. But here's what I have it broken down into. We have... The war and the ravaging, the weeping and the revolt, the worship and the request, the weary and the restless, the whining and the redeemed, and the winning and the recipients. Now, before we start, you got to ask yourself a question because I'm going to ask you and I want you to answer in your heart. Do you believe that this is the word of God? Good. Amen. Okay. All right. Good. Do you believe that all of God's word is true? Yes. Yes. Are there any errors in his book? No. no. Well, good. I'm glad you agree. Uh, as we look at what's going to take place here, I want you to understand that uh, we can all have victory, but we have to come to a place of repentance. Repentance from what? Well, we're all sinners. That's what God's word says. If you think you're not a sinner, then there's a bigger problem. We're all sinners and we're all in need of repentance. But I think what happens sometimes, what happens is that we don't truly believe all of God's word. We believe in part of it. I'm reminded of Mark uh, chapter 9 uh, when you have the father bringing his son to Jesus. And Jesus says uh, in verse 23, he says, if you can believe all things are possible to him who believes. And immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. 
And I think if you and I are honest, there are times that we could cry out the same thing to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, because if we would recognize that his word is true, all of it, it would really change the way that we all live. Uh, not, maybe some of us live more according to God's word than others, but we all fall short. Now, if you believe God's word, and you said you do, and you believe it's perfect, and you said it is, then you should also want to grow in your walk and your faithfulness. Well, in order to do that, we must believe all of God's word, and then we must repent and realize that there is victory in repentance. And that is the message that we are going to hear tonight as we look through at David's life. Now, if you remember, David is uh, running from Saul, and he's uh, living in Philistine territory. And the Philistines are about to go to war with Israel, but they say, no, nope, you ain't coming with us. And they send David away. And we pick up in verse one. Now it happened when David and his men came to Ziklag, Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag, and attacked Ziklag, and burned it with fire, and had taken captive the women and those who were there, from small to great. They did not kill anyone, but carried them away and went their way. Now, <laughs> this is a huge lesson for David. As he stepped away from God and from his people, he had no business being with the Philistines, uh, he has spent almost two years in this sinful posture. And it is getting worse and worse. And he's wasting valuable time being right with God. You know, it's interesting. Uh, on Monday, my wife came home and said that there was, they had a, you know, she tells me about how the class went and everything. And she said there was, you know, some talk about whether or not, um, uh, if there's a revealing of sin uh, even for those who aren't saved. You know, we say that, you know, hey, be sure your sin will find you out. And, and some thought, well, no, you know, if you're not a believer, you can. No, listen, God's truth is God's truth. Just like gravity is a truism, you can't defy gravity. God's word is true, whether you believe it or not. And so we <laughs> look at Hollywood right now. Boy, is, is, is sin being revealed in Hollywood hand over fist. Listen, you can go on for a long time, but let me tell you, God Almighty going to cut you down. Go tell that, but you know the song, right? Yeah. Listen, it, it, whether you're saved or not, your sin will find you out. And whether you're saved or not, there's difficulties that come when we walk opposite to the truth. See, God's word is true. Whether It's not based on God's word is true because you believe it. God's word is true, even if you and I don't believe it. God's word still stands. And so here we see David uh, not walking the way he should, not walking with God, not walking in the presence of the Lord. And so what's happening is now his sin has come to fruition. And, you know, I want to remind you of what he said in the previous chapter in verse 8. So 1 Samuel 29, verse 8. Look, so David said to Achish, But what have I done? And to this day, what have you found in your servant as long as I've been with you? That I may not go and fight against the enemies of my Lord the King? And right there, listen, he's saying, What have you found? Listen, what has God found? That's what he should be saying. God, what have you found? Look, he's, he's fighting the wrong enemy. He wants to fight against Israel. He's, he's uh, giving reference to the wrong Lord, and he's got the wrong king. And because of that, now what's going to happen is, because of his walking in the wrong direction, uh, his life is out of whack, and unfortunately, those who go with him are going to also feel this, the brunt of David's sin. Listen, right now, when he talks to Agus, it looks right, it looks noble, it feels good, but he's going against God. He's getting wealthy, he's getting rich. Everything looks great, he's in a fortified city. But he's outside the will of God. He couldn't be more vulnerable than he's ever been in his life. 
Listen, we can get embedded in sin to not uh, begin to feel that sin ain't so bad. Well, eventually we'll find out that sin is as bad as you can imagine. And there's a reason why God warns against it. David has lingered too long in darkness and the enemy now took advantage of his blindness. Now, side note, notice what it says. It says, burned with fire and taken captive. Listen, sin will burn everything in your life. It'll burn you up. You know, you can't play with fire and not expect to get burned. Now, someone might be out there saying, but wait a minute, Pastor. Isn't God a consuming fire, right? Uh, Hebrews 12, 29 says, our God is a consuming fire. Yeah, God is a consuming fire, but he consumes sin. The fire of sin consumes everything else. The only thing God will consume is sin. Everything else, that's what sin wants to consume. Your happiness, your peace, your family, your whatever, you name it. Your walk, your witness, on and on, your reputation. Sin eats everything else up. God, he's consuming fire, but he only consumes the bad things. Sin. Now, also remember that the Amalekites are a type of sin. <laughs> remember when we were back in 1 Samuel 15? Remember, Saul was supposed to kill all the Amalekites? God told him, kill all the Amalekites. And he didn't do it. He didn't want to kill them all. Well, guess what? They're back. <laughs> They're back. If he would have dealt with them, this wouldn't be happening to David and his merry men. <laughs> they show up. Listen, if you and I don't deal with our sin, it will show up to bite us. The Amalekites, by the way, what do they know? Well, here's what they know. David is a man. The Israelites, the Philistines, they're all in the valley of Jezebel. Jezebel. They're all in the valley, ready. They're, they're getting prepared for battle. So guess what? Easy pickings. <laughs> all the warriors are off preparing for battle. So you know what? Sin doesn't play fair. <laughs> Sin will consume you and those that you love around you. No man, no woman is an island. Others... Others are affected by our choices. They are. Listen, think about, think about the women and children that David and his men left back in Ziklag. What did they do? They're just chilling. They're just, what are they doing? They're following their men. They're following their dads. The women are following their men. The kids are following their dads. The old people are like, they, they may have, not have anywhere else to go. And they're looking for David for protection. And because they're following David, and because David is being disobedient, guess what? They all get to feel the outcome of sin. But there is victory always waiting around the corner, folks. You know what that victory is? The victory is in repentance. And we're going to see that in David's life. David is going to repent, thank God. And when he does, he will begin to have victory. But first, let's look at verse 3 through 6 as we look at the weeping and the revolt. So David and his men came to the city, and there it was, burned with fire. <laughs> Imagine the sight. Listen, probably as they were traveling and they were still miles out, they're like, um, wow, something, something's burning in the area of, of the town. It's, no, it's fortified. But it sure does. And as they got closer, the fire looked bigger and bigger and bigger and chills. They probably got more frantic thoughts racing through their minds, right? Can you imagine if your wife and your kids are over in the city and you realize that it's been burned, the thoughts that are flowing through their minds? Anger mixed with horror, rage mixed with helplessness. Well, and their wives, their sons, and their daughters had been taken captive. How about that? If you knew some ungodly men ungodly. That's why God wanted them wiped out. Very immoral in every possible way. Now have your beautiful wife and your beautiful children and they've burned your beautiful city 
and you feel helpless, what do you do? <laughs> then David and the people who were with him lifted their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. They were, they, they were sobbing. They, they didn't know what to do. They realized they had made a grave error. Seems hopeless. And understandably so. But God already knew. God already knew that victory was coming. But can you imagine the distress on behalf of the women and the children who were taken? As they're being ripped from their homes? Their husbands are nowhere to be found? And these are vile, disgusting men? Can you imagine the, the fear that is gripping their heart? To think that they'll never be a family again. I heard a, a gripping reaccount of, from, of a lady who experienced the horrors of being taken captive as a child. As a, as a child, she lived in Russia, and the KGB rushed in and gripped and ripped her family apart. As a child, she held on to her mother's dress as her mother held on to her, and men ripped them apart. The shock that hit her as a child, she never thought that there was anyone stronger. She never thought that anyone would overpower her mom and dad. For a child, they put all their trust in mommy and daddy. But to see mommy and daddy helpless, you lose it all. That same feeling was to, must have been rushing through the souls of the women and the children of David's mighty men. No, it ain't so mighty when you're chasing sin. And you aren't there to protect your family. Listen, these men were living in a fortified city. They were getting rich. Everything looked great. That's why they took off. Everything was peaceful. Hey, we got this covered. They've had victory after victory. They can't lose. Well, you can. You can if you're not seeking God. When we're not seeking God. Destruction is just around the corner. Not because God's going to bring it, but sin brings it. Sin burns up your life, your home, your family, your marriage, your peace, your walk, your witness. Listen, not only that, Psalm 127.1 says, Unless the Lord builds a house, they labor in vain who build it. A home must be built on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Otherwise, it's built on sinking sand. But let's say today, as we're going through this, you're like, all of a sudden, bing, a light goes off. And you're like, oh, you know what? <laughs> Maybe I'm not building my house on the truths that I claim. Remember, you said at the beginning, you said, yes, I believe God's word is true. Yes, it's perfectly in inerrant. In okay? Well, are you following God's word to the letter? Are you building your home on sinking sand? Well, here's the cool part. You and I, we can repent tonight. And victory is sure to come right around the corner. Because that's our God. Our God promises victory to those who humble themselves before his mighty hand. Let's look at verse 5. And David's two wives, Ahinoam, the Jezreelite, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite, had been taken captive. Of course, all of them had. And once again, it's, isn't it interesting? Look, we got the idea that all the women were taken hostage, right? So why does the Holy Spirit list their names? Because I believe that God it keeps reminding us of David's first error, was to take two wives was to violate God's wife, uh, God's uh, word. One wife, one husband, that makes a marriage. And so there is really no reason for the Holy Spirit to, we already understand all the women are taken, all the children are taken. The reason why it's doing that, it's emphasizing the fact that David's been out of God's will and it started way back when he took two wives. Also, to emphasize the fact that, man, David's hurting too. Look, David's got to be hurting. First of all, uh, his two wives are gone. On top of that, 
uh, his men's wives are gone and their children because of what? Because of David's foolishness. And you don't think for one moment he doesn't understand that. But even in his hurt, I think I see this. It's important that a leader understand the pain of the people. Not to lead, uh, to lead with cruelty is, is wrong, but to lead with compassion is the right way that a man should lead. Listen, there, there are two verses in the Bible that richly express this. First of all, uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. It says this, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we, yet without sin. So our high priest, Jesus Christ, he can uh, lead us compassionately. Why? Because he knows what it means to be human he knows what it means to fall uh, excuse me to be tempted although he never sinned he was tempted but he understands these things and then paul paul also said this philippians 3 10 that i may know him in the power power of his resurrection and here you go the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death in other words that i would understand compassionately what jesus christ suffered and why he suffered so that in turn then while i'm alive i can be christ because i have compassion as christ had compassion listen we sometimes think well you know hey of course jesus is going to have compassion <laughs> he's jesus but paul wasn't jesus paul was a man just like we are flawed. Remember he killed Christians? He had falling outs with his brothers, uh, spiritual brothers. Listen, he was human, as human as you and I. But he says this, listen, I need to know the power, of, uh, I need to know and have fellowship with the suffering of Christ. Why? So we can be more compassionate. It's so important. So if, to be a good leader, you have to have compassion on those who hurt. And sometimes what God will do to a man like David is break his heart. Break him. So that when he's put in that position of king, that he can be sympathetic and empathetic to those who are his subordinates in his kingdom. When, man call, when God calls a man or a woman into leadership, oftentimes first God will break them so that they can lead with compassion. And so that's what we see David right now. But on, on top of all of that, of course, we know this, God chastens those he loves. <laughs> God loves David. So he's going through a chastening and a breaking all in one frail swoop. Only God, only God can have multifaceted reasons for the difficulties that you and I go through. Verse six. Now David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because the souls the soul of all the people was grieved uh, david at this point uh, has now received the same look in these men's eyes as when they came to him in the beginning remember when they first came to him when they first came to him and said that everyone who was distressed everyone who was in debt everyone who was discontented gathered to him well guess what they're right back in, in distress and in debt well they don't have their wives their kids and discontented but now they don't want to gather to him anymore they want to gather to, to stone him listen they're in distress and they're they're discontented the proof the first time it was due to Saul this time it's due to David David should have never been in this position. Listen, as human as David is, so are his men. David's men are just like we are. Watch. For the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved. Uh, it's gone from sadness to bitterness. Don't we sometimes... Do that. Listen, they're not, they, they've gone from being sad that their wives were taken, their children were taking, taken to now being angry to where they want to kill somebody. Huh. I like what one person said. They said this, joys 
are our wings and sorrow are our spurs. I like what Frederick Huntington said this. Sorrow is our John the Baptist, clad with grim garments, with rough arms, son of the wilderness, baptizing us with bitter tears, preaching repentance, and behind him comes the gracious, affectionate, healing Lord, speaking peace, joy, and joy to the soul. I like that. I like that. But know this, folks. If you have gone, if you are going, and when you will be going through difficult times that Psalm 34, 18 says, God draws near, the Lord draws near to the brokenhearted. And I posted a quote on Facebook, and I love this quote. Our tears are often the telescope through which we see heaven more clearly. Right now, David is starting to look back to God through his tears. Listen, I, I, I think of my kids, I think of my own life, I think of people in the church. I'd rather see someone broken. I'd rather see someone hurt and broken than to see them stand proud in, in their sin. Listen, a, a person can sometimes feel victorious in their sin because things might be going really well for a moment. But trust me, God chastens those he loves. And so for, for all, the speak, all the people spoke of stoning him because the souls of all the people was grieved. Every man for his son and his daughter, but David strengthened himself in the Lord, his God. I like that contrast. It doesn't say, you know, they, want, they were wanting to stone him because of their sons and daughters, but David uh, freaked out. No, he didn't do that. He sought a plan. No, he didn't. He ran from God. No, he ignored his Bible. Uh-uh. No. When things got heated, the enemy doesn't want him to fight on their side. He's running from his own people because of Saul. Now his wife and his children, everyone's taken. All his buddies, every, all of them are gone. Now his buddies, his friends who have lost their wives, now they want to kill him because he's responsible. And does he freak out? Does he freak out? Does he get angry with God? No. What does he do? He seeks God. He strengthened himself in the Lord as God. Why? Because at this time he feels completely, utterly weak. He has no strength. He has no plan. He has no way out. He doesn't know what to do. What do you do? Listen, Psalm 27 1 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of who shall I be afraid? Well, if the Lord is your light and your salvation, if the Lord is the strength of your life, then who should we fear? The times that I have had fear, I've needed to repent from something, from many things. There is victory in repentance. And that's where David is now headed. He's now headed towards repentance. He's strengthening himself in the Lord. Not in the Philistines, not in a fortified city, not in pillaging little villages, not in his income. He's not strengthening himself in any of those things. He's strengthening himself in the Lord. And that's going to work. Let's look at the worship and the request in verse 7 through 8. And David said to Abiathar, the priest, Himelech's son, please bring the ephod here to me. And Abiathar brought the ephod to David. <laughs> Did you see it? The priest is alive. I've been telling you. They didn't take him. They didn't kill him. The irony is this. The first time when, when Saul was angry and he killed the priest, Abiathar, he, he lived. Here, for some, somehow he survives. <laughs> somehow he doesn't get snapped. Remember it said that, the, the, that they came in, the Amalekites came in and took everyone great and small? They didn't get him. Uh, it's not a coincidence. He's God's priest. He's the only one left. 
God will, God, God will preserve his servants. He does. That's why it makes me so pleased and at peace to know that I am God's servant. When things start to get turmoil, uh, when, when uh, a stormy, when turmoil starts to kick up, I remind myself, you know what? It's not my problem. He's king. I'm servant. You know, I often say this to people. Listen, when you're a servant to the king, you don't worry about how the castle's gonna, the rent's going to get paid. You don't worry about where the food's going to come from. You don't worry about those things. Why? It's the king's responsibility. Your responsibility is just to serve the king. So as I'm a servant of God, I don't worry about the battle. Sometimes. <laughs> Listen, I'm going to be honest. There are times when I'm weak, just like everyone else. But then there are times when I strengthen myself in the Lord. And there's victory. And guess what? It's based on how much you and I truly believe the word of God. Because the word of God says there is victory and repentance. And of course, we know that um, because Saul killed all the priests, that's why we saw that uh, he said, hey, God won't talk to me. So he goes to a witch. And we know that whole story from the previous. Hey, he's got a priest with an ephod. <laughs> Listen, but why? Well, because understand, in the Old Testament, they had to go through a priest. How? How blessed are we, folks? You don't have to. You don't have to go. Oh man, I need to see God, Pastor Randy. You don't need me. You can go straight to God. Isn't that awesome? I can go straight to God. He had to go through a priest, and he's a and and this is David, a man after God's own heart, and he had to go to a priest. Man, are we spoiled? Here's how spoiled we are. We can go directly to God, and yet so often that's the last person we go to. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him and said, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them without fail, recover all. Wow. Listen, it is important to inquire of the Lord. It is important to strengthen yourself in the Lord. Brother and sister, I see it all the time, even in my own life sometimes, where we will begin to do things without inquiring of the Lord. We begin to do things and we're doing it in the flesh. We do things because, oh, that makes sense. That's a good idea. Let's do that. It makes perfect sense. God doesn't always ask you to do the thing that makes perfect sense. Sometimes he wants you to do something nutty. <laughs> Listen, it's important to inquire of the Lord, but it's even more important to inquire of the Lord and to listen. But what do people do? <laughs> what do we do? Time gets difficult and people... Call other people. <laughs> Oftentimes, we might even go to God. But it's really more like going to God, complaining, demanding, dictating. God, you got to do this or I'm done. Or, you know, demanding, God, how could you do this? You know, God, if you did this, everything will work out. Complaining, God, why would you let this happen? Listen, no, 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 no. David isn't doing any of that. What is David doing? He's inquiring. God, what do you want me to do? Look, I'm freaking out. My man want to kill me? And I understand that. that I, I would want to kill me too. I, I've blown it, Lord. And I know I'm far from you, but man, I know this, Lord. If I just if I just wait upon you and do what you say, it'll all work out. And God goes, that's my boy. That's my boy. Man, he's a man after my own heart. Yes, he's blown it, but he comes back broken and sorry and asking forgiveness and then seeking to do it the right way. I like what 
First Chronicles 22, 19 says, now set your mind and heart, here you go, to seek the Lord your God. Not to seek a solution, not to seek a way out, not to seek a multitude of friends, not to, no, 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 no. Set your mind and heart to seek the Lord your God. That's the, the victory is found there. And then Jesus comes along and he gives my life verse. Matthew 6, 33. Seek now the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all else will be added to you. All else. It doesn't say seek all else and add a little God in there. <laughs> no. Our flesh, though, when things get going, things get tough, we try to comfort ourselves. You know, guys, we comfort ourselves going to the garage and throw some tools around, get in our car, rev the engine, vroom, vroom, I'm a man. <laughs> While the ladies fill a bowl with chocolate ice cream, <laughs> sit on the couch, turn on Sleepless in Seattle <laughs> and cry. We seek comfort. We seek solutions in the wrong thing, in the wrong place, and the wrong person. Your flesh will tell you to call a friend. They'll tell you what you want to hear, and you know what? Oftentimes they do. Your flesh will tell you, hey, just seek money. You can buy peace if you have enough money. Your flesh will tell you, hey, hey, Randy, just, just go get a fix. What good is this Christian stuff? Tip the bottle. Take a hit. You'll forget your troubles. Right? All the while, God's going, I'm your solution. I know it doesn't make sense to pray. It doesn't make sense to read your Bible. The question is, do you truly believe that it's true? You said you did. You're kidding. I gotcha. <laughs> Distancing ourselves from God. Hear me on this. When we distance ourselves from God, it's always for selfish reasons. Always. It's never for good reason. Yeah, you know, I was telling someone the other day, I've had many people say, gosh, I wish I would have given my life to the Lord sooner. But I've never had someone come up to me and say, you know, I wish I would have never given my life to the Lord. <laughs> never. In fact, the person who's walking right with the Lord never comes in for uh, a counseling appointment. It's only mess ups like me <laughs> who come in. And listen, it's good to come for counseling. I'm not trying to. But sometimes when we come for counseling, it's to put our eyes back where they belong. And that's a good thing. David. David is needing to put his eyes back where they belong. But when we separate, separate ourselves from God for <laughs> selfish reasons, it will hurt. Here's the worst part. It won't just help hurt you. It'll hurt those around you as well. And then here's the cool part. Because you are a child of God, God will step in when we can't win, contingent on we letting him in, and only comes by repentance of sin. I made that up. You can enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. Listen, God will come in when we can't win, but we have to let him in, and that only comes when we repent of our sin. Then we will see victory. But as long as we're holding on to sin or hiding sin or doing that, listen, victory is slow in coming and will eventually we'll hit rock bottom before we can start seeing victory because we need to repent. Colossians 3, verse 1 and 2 says this. If then you having been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things that are on the earth. <laughs> what a contrast. Saul, what does he do? He seeks a witch. David, what does he do? He turns to the Lord. 
What a contrast. In days of extreme stress and suffering, who do you turn to? The next time, maybe it's today. Maybe it was yesterday. Maybe it was last week. Maybe it's tomorrow. Maybe it's next week. But when you are suffering, when trials get hot and heavy, who you turn to reveals and how much you trust in the Lord or this world. It really does. What do you turn to for your strength? Because if you turn to anything other than God, what it says is you don't believe the word, just like you said at the beginning of this session. You all said you believe it to be true and inerrant. But when there's trouble, I'm not going to turn to it. I'm going to turn to Aunt Betty. Crocker. <laughs> Some of you got that. Get it. Go ahead. Someone, I know someone out there is thinking this. Pastor Randy, okay. But how do I do that? It flows off your lips so easy, but it's so hard to do when things are turmoil and it's noisy inside your head and you don't know what to do. Well, Jesus is a great example. Jesus over and over again said, I came to do my father's will. That got him through the hardship and the people rejecting him and all that. And then when he was the most stressed out, when, when he was praying in the garden and the great big droplets of blood were coming out, he says, not my will, but thy be done. That's how we do it. We say, you're God's will no matter what. But you know what the first thing people do when stress comes in? Pastor, I can't make it. I'm just so stressed out. I'm just going to curl up in bed. And I'm like, okay. Man, when, when I, I remember back home. Well, this is home. Back at the church I, I got saved at. <laughs> I guess it's back home. This is home. Stop it. <laughs> the church I got saved at. I remember there were times when, when things would get really, really intense. You know what? I, I, I went even more towards being in, in the church amongst his people, in worship, in service, reading my Bible, praying, because there was no other place I was going to get strength. And you know what? Victory came. Victory will come. So right now, for David, looks like defeat. You know, right now we're reading this. But you got a picture. David, he's in a foreign land. He's in ungodly territory. The king of the Jews, well, the, not the king of the Jews, but right now the Jewish king, is enthroned and wants to kill him. The Philistines don't trust him. His own men want to kill him. His wife and his family are gone and all their men are gone. And he's going, we've lost. It's over. Game over, man. But victory is right around the corner. Listen, I'm, I'm telling you, there are those times when you and I think, game over, man, game over. And God's going, my word says with me, all things are possible. I know, Lord, but game over. <laughs> oh, so you should be saying, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. There's victory and repentance. Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them and without fail recover all. Why? How? Well, humbly seeking the Lord's will, repentance, resisting our own emotion. <laughs> here's, here's the big mountain. Here's the big hurdle. But Pastor Eddie, I don't feel like praying to God. Oh, it's feelings. Those are real. <laughs> well, they're real to me. Okay, well, your feelings are contradictory to the Bible. So which one's right? We have to, here you go, die to ourselves. And you know what that is? My emotions, my feelings, nothing more than feelings. I have to die to these things. But it begins with repentance and resisting my own emotions. The faith to follow God's directions even if I don't understand them. 
And then God doesn't just bring them back. He could. You know what? David has repented. He could have like a storm go through the Amalekites to, uh, fort and just kill the Amalekites and have all the Jewish people going, what just happened? And the storm came through, lightning hit, hit all of them, but it didn't touch us. He could do that. He's God, but he doesn't. You know why? You know why God doesn't just have the earth crack open and all the Amalekites fall in and the Jews stand there happily going, whoa, that was awesome. Because God wants to see faith in action. Your problem. People come to me, but God could just fix this problem. Yeah, he could. And he can. But he wants to see faith in action. He loves to see when we put our trust in him and he goes, oh, that's a man or a woman after my own heart. I just love them. That's what he wants from us, folks. Faith. Faith that moves into action. Not just faith that comes out of our mouth. That's easy. He wants to see action. He could have, he could have done this. He didn't, need, he didn't need David to go and get them. God could have done it all by himself. He could have sent an angel to wipe them out. He does it at other times in the Bible. But he wants to see faith in action. Where are you at today? Got some turmoil, <laughs> got a storm <sighs> raging, it hurts, tears coming down. I know, I know what it's like. I'm a crybaby. I know what it's like to cry when it hurts. Use those as telescopes to see God clear. Turn to him, and whatever his word says, you do it. And watch victory come. Because God promises, and God's promises true you 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 agreed with me we, let's look at the weary and the restless in verse 9 through 16 so david went he and 600 men who were with him and came to the brook bashor where those stayed who were left behind but david pursued he and 400 men for 200 stayed behind who were so weary they could not cross the brook Bishor. Now, it's a, it's, this has been exhausting days. First, they travel all the way to where the battle was going to take place to talk to the Philistines and say, hey, we want to fight with you guys. They said no. They send them back. They come back. They see they're freaking out. They, they see the fire. They're crying to the point of no having no more strength in them. Then they want to kill David, and now they have to go and travel to kill the Amalekites. Listen, they are sapped of energy. When you feel like all is hope is lost, your energy is sapped. You know, when, I, when I've been depressed before, all you want to do when you're depressed is just, I just want to lay down. But imagine also having strenuous activity that's drained you in tears to the point where you're draining. You're, you're drained. And that's where they are. So some of the guys, they just couldn't go any further. Verse 11. And they found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David. And they gave him bread to eat and let him drink water. And they gave him a piece of cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. Wow. Man, David is being very benevolent. <clears throat> he could have just gave him some bread and some water. He gives him a, a cake of figs and a cluster of raisins. And he's just taking care of the guy. And, and I think of Hebrews 13 too, that says, Do not forget to entertain strangers. For by doing so, some have unwittingly entertained angels. Now, real quick, don't get caught up on that angel word. Now, I, I do believe that you can entertain angels. How that works, I don't know. How often does that happen? <laughs> I'm going to probably say not very often. But the word angel, angloss, means messenger or envoy. One who is sent, a messenger of God. Listen, you can be an angel. You come and give me a message of hope from God, a scripture. You're, a, you're an angel. <laughs> Not, you know, angel with wings. But you're a messenger, an angelos of God. And so sometimes you, you see a stranger, you, you have no idea who you may be helping. You have no idea. 
Uh, real quick, I remember a story of, uh, I'm not going to tell you the name of the millionaire, uh, billionaire, but evidently he uh, had a problem with his limousine broke down on the side of the road. Limousine, right? So these, this nice couple, they just gotten married. Uh, the husband and Christian couple, they decided, this is in Los Angeles, decided to pull over and see if they could help this, you know, uh, limo driver, you know, change a tire or whatever he needed to do. So he got in there and helped the guy change the tire. The, the person in the back never rolled down the window. Uh, but he did tell the driver, get their name. He got their name, and the next day they got a call that their house had been paid off by this millionaire mm -hmm. for, for, for showing love and kindness uh, to that person. And so, kind of neat. True story, by the way, and I'm not going to tell you the name of the person. Go look it up. Okay, so, <laughs> happened in L.A. when I was out there. It was pretty neat. But um, anyways, <clears throat> listen, we never, you never know who you're helping. You never know who it is or what might transpire. The, the point is this. We should be loving as much as humanly possible. <laughs> Yeah, we're going to have to wrap up. But I want to tell you, one, one time Jennifer and I were, were going to Sam's and uh, uh, we had gone to eat lunch there at Chili's, I think it was. And we came out and there was a gal, you know, she looked homeless and she was talking to some other people. She was like saying, all I want is some food. I just want some food. And I pulled up. I said, we'll, we'll help her out. I said, OK. I said, I don't have any money. I use card, you know, plastic. She goes, sir. I, I just want some food. Can, can, I said, great. I'll tell you what. I'm going to go get you some food, and I'll be right back. Went and got her some food, and she was, she had, I was like, just wait right here. I'll go back. So I went through the drive-thru and got her some food, and I came back. She was walking away, and I pulled over, and we sped up, and I got her out of the car. And I said, ma'am, here's your food. She goes, what, are you crazy? <laughs> she goes, you think I'm going to accept food from you? I'm like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh, my gosh. She was not an Anglos. <laughs> so she, she was not very Anglos at that moment. <laughs> but, you know, we were like, we were fabric, flabbergasted. And, and uh, I just looked at Jen and I said, well, Riley's going to get a special lunch today. <laughs> so we took it to Riley. But, <laughs> but uh, folks... the Lord, believe his word from cover to cover, and, and you know what, don't just sit in here and say, I believe the word, but let our actions line up with the things we say we believe. Let our actions be louder than words. And if you're struggling to trust God in his word, repent, because if you're willing to repent, victory is not far behind. Let's pray. Father, we thank you once again for your word that is just so, so amazingly true. Father, we don't have to agree with it. We don't have to believe it. We just have to live it. <laughs> we have to like it sometimes, but Lord, it's, it's, it's always for our benefit. And so, Father, I pray that we would, we would be those people, Lord, that weren't so stiff-necked or stubborn that we wouldn't kick against the goats, that we would come into your presence with thanksgiving, knowing that you, Lord, your promises and your word and your son and the Holy Spirit love us and are willing to help us to find victory and peace when things just don't seem to be all that we thought they should be. And so, God, we just love you. And I thank you for my brothers and sisters. And I pray, Lord, you would go before us. And now, Lord, may we offer up our, our voices as we sing one last song. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Oh, never mind. No song. <laughs> sing for us. Pray to each other. Sing for us. <laughs> Savior, God bless you.